I'm going to just pause for a second. I know people are, are heading off to other events, and I know everybody is um, desperate to get home and watch Dumb and Dumber. So. <laughs> What's I did not tell you is that I'm something of an add-on and a substitute in this discussion, and so uh, I would perhaps have little to add a substance to the already incredibly compelling and important testimony that we've heard from Pradeus and the incredibly insightful analysis that we heard from Nick. But I'd like to focus slightly differently on a set of related questions. Um, and begin by observing the kind of strangely paradoxical predicament in which we find ourselves. Um, a predicament that has been alluded to or identified by the speakers, that in some ways we find it impossible to accord uh, veracity to anything that we cannot document through the photographic form. Only that which can be rendered visible is thought to be uh, verifiable uh, on a common sense level. And so, as Curtis makes very clear, a number of things vanish from the space of analysis and criticism. On the other hand, we feel ourselves to be in an environment that is absolutely saturated with a relentless barrage of imagery, and at the same time, we have a shockingly narrow range of images of this war. Almost no images of this war come daily into our living rooms as they did, for example, during the Vietnam War, when the period of broadcast was much briefer. But nonetheless, the regularity, the intensity, the apparent immediacy of those images um, was greater. So these, this kind of strange predicament that we're in, in which on the one hand we're, we're in an environment saturated with images and we have very few that give us uh, something like um, a picture of what's going on around the world, a suspicion about that which can't be pictured at the same time, and the denigration of the persistent forms of violence that don't rise to the level of the visible. So in that context, I'd like to ask some questions about some images which did cross the threshold of visibility, that did shock us, that did propel many people to ask questions about the nature of this war and the nature of the relationship between the, the sort of two topics that organize the, the, the sessions, the discussion, <coughs> culture and truth. I think, Nick, you are absolutely correct to note that, you know, our uh, our media sphere, popular cultural landscape now is full with narratives in which uh, torture has been redeemed as the means to the technique of accessing the truth. It has been affected to knowledge production in this way. In fact, has assumed a kind of privileged place in the um, imagination of how it is that one can access that which is being withheld from us. And needless to say, enemies of any sort are imagined at present as those who would not only do harm, but would withhold the truth of their actions from us, and whose um, defeat and or the, whose, whose um, nullification depends upon our accessing the truth of their intentions in some way. So torture has arisen to a kind of new status um, as the means by which we pass through the barriers to uh, total vision and total knowledge, and um, as a kind of privileged uh, means technique of generating knowledge. And of course, the, the, the sort of theoretical uh, uh, form in which that, that presumption gets articulated um, takes a kind of narrative form, the narrative of the ticking bomb scenario, most famously associated with Alan Dershowitz's legal theory, in which we all fasten, uh, you know, fantasize a moment in which we desperately need to know something, in which a horrible event will occur if we don't know about <coughs> something. And therefore, despite the fact that we would rather not torture, we suspend the ethical prohibitions, the legal sanctions against torture in order to do what is necessary to prevent an eventuality of catastrophic consequences. And the fabulous thing about that narrative scenario is that, you know, who can argue almost against it? In a moment of desperation, no matter how far one would argue against it, one could imagine oneself doing or signing on to a desperate gesture of that sort. And it is a spurious and utterly sophistic narrative, one that has been very well repudiated by Elaine Scarry, and I recommend to you her, um, her response to that in the volume on uh, torture in which she is actually juxtaposed in print with, with um, Alan Dershowitz, and she makes a very important point. 
that the ticking bomb scenario has as its axiomatic ground the assumption that we know that the person we are interrogating possesses the knowledge we need to stave off the eventual catastrophe. That is, it's kind of, it assumes a kind of meta character, an omniscient overseer who knows what he doesn't know and knows where what he doesn't know is located. And of course, alas, there is never any structure that can guarantee that such a thing exists. I want to, us to consider, uh, via this narrative, uh, I want to ask us to reflect again on a moment in 2004 when the images of the brain first circulated in the public sphere, and recall, if we can, the shock and the horror that many people experienced upon that first um, disclosure and on the appearance of those images, asking also how long it is that we should see these things first in Salon and the New Yorker <coughs> instead of in other venues that are supposed to perform the function, function of investigation. Remember that moment of shock and ask ourselves what it was that shocked us and ask ourselves what we can retrieve from that moment while bearing in mind the fact that I think we have all come to believe that the archive is one of the, the only, if nonetheless deeply um, uh, su suspect resources we have with which to combat a regime that has usurped and deformed language and representation. The very institutions that are producing the records of abuse are, ironically enough, the institutions from which we have to draw our resources in order to contest what's going on. And among those most powerful resources are the archives maintained by the Department of Defense, forced open, pried open regularly through um, uh, uh, Freedom of Information Act petitions, the work of the ACLU, work of people like, like your own organization and so forth. We end up working in a complicit, a corrupt, and already contaminated archive, but it is what we have to work with, and the photographs of, Ar of, of Abu Ghraib are the first instance that we might consider in that regard. The total archive of this war would include not just the DOD, not just the records of various secret committees in the White House, not just the records of the prisons, not just the records of the institutions that train the jailers, and so forth. They would also have to include the popular cultural universe, the private screen saving uh, archives, image archives of members of the military and others. Remember, of course, that many of the images that shocked us from Abu Ghraib had functioned as screen savers among military personnel of Abu Ghraib. What shocked us about Abu Ghraib, of course, was not just the images. In fact, what we weren't often sure what those images represented. We needed captions. We needed explanation, as does every photograph require an external gesture by which it called a language to anchor itself. We saw those images and we were shocked by the obvious enjoyment of the persons in the images. We were shocked that the photograph showed not just those being tortured, but those torturing and showed them in poses of apparent satisfaction. I think that shock obstructed another set of readings of those images that we could and should pursue. A uh, set of readings that we'd have to undertake while we're asking ourselves <coughs> what it is you can read from photographs of that sort. What it is that they can disclose about what's going on in a place like Abu Ghraib. Um, a few things need, one of the things I think we can get from those photographs is an understanding that torture and truth are absolutely not necessarily and rarely involved in any relationship with each other. Not only is torture not undertaken primarily in the context of a ticking bomb scenario, it is rarely, 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 even in times of war, deployed in the interest of intelligence generation. And you don't have to take my word for it. We can look to the archive produced by the Department of we can look at the Fay and Jones reports that were generated in 2004 when it became necessary to investigate what Fay and Jones and Taguba after them said was simply a perverse night shift of random, unusual, exceptional individuals unmoored from the structures of discipline 
and ethical oversight that the military is supposed to offer. Those reports, and reports generated by the International Committee of the Red Cross, both concluded, or all concluded, there were several in the end, that according to the International Committee of the Red Cross, between 70 and 90% of all people in Abu Ghraib were there by mistake. The Department of Defense concluded that 90 to 95% of the people at Abu Ghraib were not there for intelligence purposes. 